weirdos, welcome back to another episode of Dark Crossroads. This is your host, Roxanne Fletcher. Today we're covering a case that I just wanted to get a few more eyes on it, and I'm trying to get all the signatures on the petition I'm going to leak at the end so that we can try to get this case reopened and get answers for the family. So if you want to try a free and easy way to help with this case, just wherever you're listening to this, share the podcast, like it, tell your friends about it, get the word out there so we can get some more eyes on this case. But before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping things to go over. I want to send a huge shout out to Soul Prod Music. They are the creators of our intro and outro song, which I am absolutely in love with. And if you are looking for anything like that, please check them out. You can just Google their name, Soul Prod Music. I also want to do a special shout out to one of our newest subscribers. If you go on to the links that will be in the show notes or wherever I share these episodes, there is a thing called um, support the podcast and you do a monthly donation. It's very small, but every cent matters and counts and it goes towards this podcast for research, equipment, everything I need. I'm doing this all out of pocket and every cent counts and I am so beyond grateful for everybody, for all of your support and everything. And I just want to keep giving you more and better content. So the more support I get, the better you guys will receive information. So anyway, our newest subscriber to the podcast. Thank you so much, Sue Cassidy. I cannot explain how absolutely excited I am about this. And when you sign up to be an exclusive member or support the show, you will start getting exclusive content, behind the scenes content, promo codes and coupons for the store that is opening very soon and a lot more. So do that. You'll start getting the emails, you'll join the sites and it will be absolutely amazing. I cannot wait for all of this and I cannot wait to hear anything back from you guys. I love the feedback. I know I finally have been getting the groove of things. I started off this podcast not knowing anything and I have learned so much and I have met so many amazing people. I think that you should support this podcast, but also whatever podcasts you listen to, it's so important to like, share, review, all that stuff because it helps them stay up on the charts and helps us be able to keep podcasting, basically. Um, So all support is so much appreciated. I'm sorry I went on this huge rant, but it really does mean the world to me. But with all that said, um, I guess we'll just jump right into the case. Um, I'm so excited about this one, and I really hope we can get the word out. So thank you guys so much, and let's get started. Mitrice Richardson, age 24, was known as being naturally compassionate and very busy. She had two jobs, one as a store clerk and the other as a dancer at an LGBTQIA plus club, as well as holding an internship in her field of study, which was psychology. She was a lover of sunflowers and was closest with her grandmother. Maitrice was a gifted and ambitious student with high hopes for her future and the determination to make those dreams come true. That's why her family was deeply concerned when her behavior grew erratic shortly before she disappeared. At some point during the fall of 2009, Maitrice's world begins to crumble. She and her girlfriend at the time break up. Her bipolar disorder no longer seems to be under control, The outgoing and responsible young woman is now sending strange text messages and posting bizarre social media posts. In the middle of September in 2009, she texts a friend about being a part of the universe and a part of nature. To her mother on September 16th, Maitrice texts, Watch the news today, it's going to shock the hell out of you. And on Facebook, she posts, I just want to sleep, lol, but you know me and my crazy ideas, let's see where they take me. That same evening, when all the strange texts and posts were sent, 
A manager from Jeffrey's, which is a restaurant locally, states that prior to the time of Maitrice entering the restaurant, she was found in one of the staff members' vehicles located in Jeffrey's parking lot, going through his CD collection. When Maitrice is questioned about being in this vehicle, she begins speaking gibberish. After the staff witnesses Maitrice's erratic and bizarre behavior in the Jeffrey's parking lot, she is then allowed to enter the restaurant to order a meal and an alcoholic beverage, which totals to $89. Again, witnesses inside describe Maitrice's behavior as strange. She allegedly tells a few people she is from Mars and is here to avenge none other than Michael Jackson's death. While waiting for her order, a Kobe steak and an Ocean Breeze cocktail, in case you were wondering, my tree sits down at a full table with a party of seven already dining. According to patrons and staff, she seems a bit off. In LA Magazine, they described her as being eccentric and at one point claiming that she was from Mars. The table she sits down with, though, does not ask her to leave. The diners later leave, and Maitrice is presented with her bill that totals $89. She isn't able to pay this, though, so she calls her grandmother, who offers to pay for the meal. But at the time, the restaurant needs a faxed signature for payment, and Maitrice's grandmother doesn't have a fax machine. With no one else to call, the owner of the restaurant, Jeff Peterson, calls the sheriff's department. Around 7.40 p.m. that night, an employee at Jeffrey's restaurant calls 911, explaining that there is a black woman there acting like she is on drugs, who is also refusing to pay her bill. Three male officers from the Malibu Lost Hills Sheriff's Department respond to the call at Jeffrey's, where at least nine witnesses inform officers of Mitrice's behavior. At 9.50 p.m. that night, which is about two hours later, the Malibu Lost Hills Sheriff's Department deputies detain, arrest, and book Mitrice after finding personal use marijuana in her car. In California, personal use marijuana is a citable offense that usually doesn't result in an arrest. At the time of her arrest, Deputy Brower conducts a field sobriety test, which indicates that Mitrice was not intoxicated at the time. Maitrice was arrested and booked for defrauding an innkeeper in possession of marijuana. The same deputies that detained her also impound Maitrice's car. Inside her car, they leave her purse, phone, identification, and ATM card. Maitrice's mother calls the Lost Hills Sheriff Station to ask about picking her daughter up. She is told Maitrice wouldn't be released until the following morning. About three hours after her arrest at 12.30 a.m., police speak on the phone with Maitrice's mother, and then Maitrice is eventually released, but none of her belongings are returned to her. An employee of the station reportedly offered for Maitrice to stay overnight at the station. However, according to this employee, Maitrice declined. Maitrice had no safe way to get home or any way to contact somebody for help. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department claimed that at the time of her release, Maitrice was not showing any signs of intoxication or any mental illness. Early the next morning, Bill Smith, a former reporter for KTLA News, calls the police to report a woman wandering around his backyard early that morning, likely around 6.30 a.m., but about six hours after Maitrice's release. Bill's residence was about six miles west of the Lost Hills Station and is located at the bottom of Dark Canyon in a gated community. Bill describes her as a slim, black woman with afro hair. Bill reports that he calls out of his window to ask if she is okay, to which she responds that she is just resting. By the time Bill has put something on so he can go out and investigate, she is gone, having disappeared back into the mountains beyond his home. Officials later report that there is a potential sighting of Maitrice walking down Malibu Canyon Road at approximately 7.30 a.m. on the morning of her disappearance. This sighting has not yet been confirmed by any officials. Officials also later reported that another potential sighting of Maitrice that occurred a few hours after the first one, and this one was on Pioma Road in Calabasas, and this one also has not been confirmed by officials. Within two weeks of Maitrice's disappearance, the Board of Supervisors approves a $10,000 reward for any information in her disappearance. This reward is set to expire in December of 2009. 
Fast forward to November of 2009, officials report that they receive a tip regarding a potential sighting of Mitris in Thousand Oaks, California. Park rangers responded to the rural area of Thousand Oaks, where the tipster reported seeing a young black woman, but they were not able to find the individual in question. After not finding any leads, and as the initial deadline for the $10,000 reward for information rapidly approaches once it hits December, the deadline is eventually extended to June of 2010. On the morning of January 9, 2010, around 7 a.m., air and ground searches began at Malibu Creek State Park. Approximately 200 volunteer search teams, including police helicopters, Horses and search dogs are included in the search. Agencies that were involved include the Los Angeles Police Department and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, but they never found any sign of my trees. On March 16th of 2010, around six months after my trees was last seen leaving the sheriff's station, her parents criticized authorities' search efforts for their daughter. Standing on the front steps of the Los Angeles County Hall of Administration, her parents share their concerns about the slow-moving search efforts and that they believe local politicians are ignoring their pleas for help. According to Mitrice's mother, authorities haven't been returning any of her phone calls. She states, we've been trying to get drones out to search Malibu Canyon. A few days later, on March 28th of 2010, Family members, friends, and community members gather to search six areas across Los Angeles area for Matrice. The locations of these searches include Skid Row, Malibu, Calabasas, Agora, Santa Monica, and Hollywood. Nothing is found during any of these searches. In May of 2010, U.S. Representative Maxine Waters sends a request to the Department of Justice for the review of the handling of Mitrice's case thus far by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Waters explains in the request that she believes that Mitrice's civil rights were violated when she was released from the police station in the middle of the night without her cell phone, car, or purse on the night of her disappearance. Later interviews with an FBI spokesperson reveals that the Bureau had considered this request, however, there is not enough information to lead to the FBI or the DOJ's involvement at this time. After having been extended to June of 2010, eventually the $10,000 reward for any information in Mitrice's case eventually expires. In July, officials end up receiving a tip that Mitrice may have been seen at the Rio Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. According to a person who is named as Greg, who claims to be a high school friend of Mitrice's, explains to police that they had seen Mitrice at the hotel, approached her, and said hi. According to this witness, Mitrice had a surprised look on her face before leaving immediately. Officials reportedly visit Las Vegas to investigate the sighting, but according to LAPD captain at the time, it is not a verified sighting of her, but we feel good enough to come up here and spend a great deal of time to get the information out to the community. According to Mitrice's father, an investigator informs him that there have been dozens and dozens of potential sightings of Mitrice that have been reported in Las Vegas. On June 29th of 2010, Mitrice's mother sues both the Los Angeles County and the Sheriff's Department for negligence, and for the wrongful death of her daughter. And on July 13th of 2010, following the expiration of the $10,000 reward being offered for any information in this case, in July, the reward is reestablished. Along with all this, Mitrice's father later informs reporters after a press conference in Las Vegas that he had filed a lawsuit against law enforcement from Los Angeles on July 27th. The lawsuit concerns a violation of civil rights, wrongful release, and gross negligence, according to him. On July 28, 2010, at 11 a.m., officials with Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department hold a press conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. During this press conference, officials announce a $25,000 reward for any information regarding her whereabouts. Additionally, officials announce during this press conference 
that they had received around 70 tips of potential sightings of my trees in Las Vegas. On August 9th of 2010, about a year after she had gone missing, a park ranger is patrolling part of Dark Canyon. He is out to look for an illegal marijuana grow in the area. The area is approximately 8 miles from the Lost Hill Station, and it's hard to access. There are no trails. The area is steep with overgrowth and has jagged rocks. While making his way through the overgrowth, he comes across a human skull. The park ranger then calls the sheriff's office. Near the body was racially and sexually themed graffiti which appeared fresh, along with paint cans and similar material. Adjacent to the creek bed where Mitrice's body was found is a ranch well known by law enforcement as a pornographic production location. Locals claim to have heard screams in the area within the next few nights after Mitrice's disappearance. Mitrice's body was found naked and mummified, with her skull found separately from the rest of her body and her clothes scattered throughout the ravine. Despite the bizarre circumstances under which her body was discovered and its condition, Mitrice's case was never declared a homicide, and police have determined that foul play was not involved. Her family refuses to accept this as an answer. Following the discovery of skeletal remains in Malibu Canyon, officials hold a press conference. During this press conference, officials state that the remains appear to be those of a female, and add that women's clothing was found at the scene with the remains. On August 12th of 2010, four days after the remains were discovered in Malibu Canyon, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department reports that the remains do belong to Mitrice, and that they were confirmed through dental records, and this was all stated in a press conference. The sheriff adds that there is no indication of a homicide, but also adds that her remains would be capable of telling us a story that would possibly lead to this possibility. At this time, there is no cause of death released by any officials. According to Assistant Chief Coroner Ed Winter, the cause of death is being deferred, pending further investigation, and that the remains were identified using dental records. Authorities at this time are not under the belief that foul play is involved in Mitrice's death. After the announcement of the identification of Mitrice's remains, her father publicly requests that the sheriff take a polygraph examination or a lie detector test. There is no further discussion of this request, and it is unknown whether the sheriff did agree to this request. Around a week after Mitrice's remains were discovered in Malibu Canyon, civil rights activist Al Sharpton vows to file a federal inquiry into Mitrice's death. Sharpton explains this in an interview with The Root, stating that the incident must be raised to a review of what the process was compared to others in the area. It could be a test case of what's going on around the country, where missing African Americans are not considered a priority for law enforcement or the media. On August 16th of 2010, at 6 p.m., following the first anniversary of the discovery of Mitrice's remains, her family hosts a candlelight vigil in her honor in Los Angeles, California. More than 100 people attend the vigil, where music plays, incense burns, and community members offer their support to her family. On August 20th of 2010, friends and family of Mitrice gather at Inglewood Park Cemetery for her funeral, which was followed by a large memorial service and vigil for Mitrice. In November of 2010, Assistant Chief Coroner Ed Winter publicly shares his frustration with the Sheriff's Office in their removal of Mitrice's remains from the scene without the coroner's permission. According to Ed Winter, the Sheriff's deputies may have violated the law and undermined the thoroughness of the coroner's investigation by prematurely moving the skeletal remains. From here, the coroner's office opens an inquiry into the handling of Mitrice's case. In response to this claim, a spokesman with the L.A. County Sheriff's Department acknowledges that the responding deputies did remove Mitrice's remains without permission from the coroner's office. He adds, however, 
that they only removed the remains because it was getting dark outside and they worried that animals may tamper with the remains. In early November of 2010, while visiting the site where Mitrice's remains had previously been located, her mother, along with a few other friends and family members, end up finding a finger bone. Clea Koff, who was the founder and forensic anthropologist from the Missing Persons Identification Resource Center, describes the situation as upsetting and distressing, adding that the discovery of this bone immediately told us that despite their best efforts, the removal of the body on August 8th of 2010 may have compromised this investigation. Another press conference is held again on December 20th, and Mitrice's mother requests that her daughter's remains be exhumed and that there be a re-examination of her remains. Clea Koff joins Mitrice's mother in this request, citing that further examination will lead us to a place where we have ruled out more scenarios. Clea Koff further explains that the L.A. County Coroner's Office missed several things in their initial examination of the remains, including hair evidence, which should have been compared to hair found in the area where the remains were discovered. Additionally, she also mentions that further examination should be conducted of Mitrice's teeth and maggots, which were found at the scene as well. Mitrice's mother also requests that the FBI get involved in Mitrice's case. In response to this, the FBI spokesperson explains that the FBI hasn't received any information that would lead to the FBI's jurisdictional involvement. The following month, Los Angeles County Sheriff Lee Baca requests that the FBI assist in their investigation into Mitrice's disappearance. The FBI, though, declines the request for any assistance, citing the issues with chain of custody, and that any efforts on their part would only duplicate the work that investigators have already done. But, later on that month, after initially declining the request to assist in the Los Angeles County's investigation of Mitrice's death, the FBI agrees to examine Mitrice's remains. Plans are made to exhume Mitrice's body and to send the remains to the FBI's headquarters in Virginia. On February 13th of 2011, More than six months after partial skeletal remains were located and identified as belonging to Mitrice, officials uncover additional remains. Specifically, officials found eight additional bone fragments over the course of over four hours in the same area where the first set of bones were discovered. According to an L.A. County Sheriff's Department spokesperson, the bones appeared to be that of fingers, a wrist, the neck, and ribs. In May of 2011, a second lawsuit is filed by Mitrice's mother, alleging that deputies who reported to the scene where Mitrice's remains were discovered improperly moved the remains from the discovery site. Mitrice's mother also alleges negligence as well as both intentional and negligent infliction of emotional distress. On July 13th of 2011, Mitrice's remains are exhumed for another examination by a private pathologist that was hired by her family. Along with a planned examination, her remains are exhumed to add the bones found after her funeral. Mitrice's mother eventually files a suit against the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department for wrongful death and negligence, referring to the officers who arrested, booked, and eventually released Mitrice from the police station in the middle of the night. Mitrice's mother files the lawsuit with the notion that the responding officers ignored her daughter's strange behavior and did not take any action to evaluate her mental state. Following these multiple lawsuits against law enforcement agencies in Los Angeles County, the LA Board of Supervisors approves a $900,000 settlement for Mitrice's case. The settlement would be split between Mitrice's parents, though they did not immediately accept this offer. In March of 2012, previous issues regarding communication between the Sheriff's Department and the Coroner's Office led the Office of Independent Review to investigate and release a report in March of 2012. Based on the information that is explained in this report, the Coroner's Office had given the Sheriff's Department permission to remove, quote, some of the remains before authorities had found a full skeleton, end quote. Despite previous allegations from the coroner's office that stated otherwise, 
The report maintains that, that there is no cover-up taking place in Mitrice's case, but the report recommends that the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department trains their field units on how to properly communicate to the coroner at a scene where there is a body, according to a KPCC article. In June of 2012, the cities of Agora Hills and Calabasas offer $15,000 as a reward for any information in Mitrice's case. Fast forward to December 3rd of 2015. Lost Compassion, a documentary that dives into the mystery of Mitrice's death, is screened for the first time at the Malibu International Film Festival. An investigation was originally rejected but was eventually opened in 2016 to determine if the sheriff's office mishandled the investigation in any way. Mitrice's family is particularly concerned that her body was removed from the crime scene against the orders of the coroner by detectives who were working on the case. This runs counter to how investigations are normally conducted and demonstrates possible misconduct in the handling of the case. The California Attorney General's Office determined in late 2016 that there was not sufficient evidence to suggest that the Sheriff's Department's conduct was criminal, and charges were never filed, though Mitrice's relatives were awarded $450,000 in 2011 for civil wrongful death charges. According to a report released by the Office of the Attorney General, there is insufficient evidence to support a criminal prosecution for destruction, alteration, or concealment of evidence. On October 12th of 2019, Governor Gavin Newsom vetoes legislation, which would change the rules regarding overnight releases, and this was Senate Bill 42. Senate Bill 42 would have required county jails in California to allow those being released to stay until daylight hours if they chose, and also to provide a safe place to wait for a ride and for the released inmate to charge a mobile phone while waiting after business hours, according to the Los Angeles Times newspaper. Governor Newsom cites the provision that allowing inmates to stay overnight past release would cause costly damages to local governments, which would require reimbursement by the state. There is currently a $40,000 reward being offered to anyone with information about Mitrice's death. Those with any information are asked to contact Crime Stoppers. This would be anonymous. You can contact them at 1-800-222-TIPS. There is also a very quick and easy and free way to help support her friends and family. Um, they are, have a petition that they want to reopen her case. It only needs a few more signatures. I've already went and signed it. Um, I very much hope that all of my listeners, all of my weirdos will go and sign this petition and help her family. She deserves justice and her family deserves answers. So one quick sig signature can help get this case reopened and get more eyes on it. Alrighty, so thanks for hanging out again today. I love hearing from you guys and I love reading all the comments and suggestions and everything that you guys have sent. If you are looking for a way to contact us, you can contact us at darkcrossroadspodcast at gmail.com. We also have a website, darkcrossroadspodcast.com. You can find us pretty much anywhere on social media. Um, if you want a case read or research that you want on the show, just send it over. Say hello. Um, if you're looking for any promo codes or discounts or exclusive or more content, then head over to the support the show and um, you will start diving into a world of extra. <laughs> um, but with all that said, I will talk to you guys later. And don't forget to be weird, stay different, and don't trust anyone. Dark Crossroads Podcast is brought to you by Problem Wildlife. Problem Wildlife serves Western Massachusetts and has been humanely protecting your house and family from unwanted pests for over 20 years. Take back your space with an animal control service that you can trust. They are family owned, fully licensed, and are knowledgeable and dependable. To find out more about their services, 
simply visit their website at www.problemwildliferemoval.com. Again, that's www.problemwildliferemoval.com. And the website will also be included in our show notes.